Hello, and welcome to the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast, where you'll hear conversations that generate one aha moment after another for you. There is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about yet. But we're changing that. The world is full of millions of good people that we're trying to shine a light on here at the Goodness Exchange and the Conspiracy of Goodness podcast. You know, we talk to people that are tackling some of the, pro the biggest problems in the world, and they still think the future is bright. We need to know what they know. We need to know what they do when they hit obstacles, when they find opportunities and setbacks, and we need to live with the same burning sense of excitement that they see as possible. So today we have an amazing guest who's going to take us on a journey that we could not go without go on without him. Paul Hawken. Paul starts ecological businesses, writes about nature and commerce and consults with heads of states and CEOs about climate and what he calls ecological regeneration. I know that sounds like a big word, but oh my gosh, the way Paul puts it gave me goosebumps head to toe in a quick interview that we did right before this podcast. So Paul's got New York Times bestsellers in his bio. He's been um, interviewed on the Today Show and has uh, just so much background that he's going to share with us. Welcome, Paul Hawken. Okay, thank you, Linda, so much. Uh, yeah. it's, it's a joy to be here. Uh, everything uh, you stand for and do is sort of, uh, we're behind you all the way on your way of seeing the world. Well, I hope that I will turn countless people onto onto your work because it's it's a shared future for us all that you're talking about and you talk about it with such possibility which is what we all need right now we need opportunity thinking instead of threat thinking and i know that you you are, have come up with some really like a cascade of solutions i mean that in itself is a different way of thinking about problem solving is all it is through the lens of solutions well, absolutely. I mean, the the climate dialogue uh, for decades, frankly, <laughs> until this day, has been very much it, it arose from the science community and the science community 50 years ago said, you know, uh, Houston, we have a problem, you know, and but it was forward. It wasn't that time, you know, but it was say we're going to have a problem. And then as that voice became louder and more uh, credible, uh, not to say that science is incredible, it is, but not until it's heard. And then as it, then activists took it up and they took the future existential threat uh, mantra of science, which is this poses a future existential threat to humanity, to the living world, to civilization. Okay, so activists took that up and then they added, uh, you know, shame, fear and guilt to that, you know, which is we should be afraid of it. Uh, you should be tacitly they're saying you should be ashamed you're doing this and you're causing it you know don't you feel guilty they would use those words but that's essentially uh you know knitted into the language uh as a way to motivate people uh and of course we know from neuroscience that it doesn't motivate people whatsoever uh and then today then what happened is we have what i call othering language which is we are fighting tackling combating climate change uh, and uh, and the climate movement is full of jargon. It's full of acronyms: 1.5 C, decarbonization, negative emissions, the UNFCC, which sponsors the IPCC, which is like. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you, you know, 99 point whatever percent of people are like you lost me. You know what? You know, two sentences ago, three sentences ago, people don't respond to that kind of language. You know. And the thing is that the emphasis has been again and again and again, and still is on the probability of what's going to go wrong, when and how it's getting wronger or faster than we thought it was before, you know, which may, you know, you were afraid before, be more afraid, you know, in a sense, you know, or be more concerned or whatever. And the way I look at it is the science is extraordinary. I mean, it just, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is a, consortium of scientists from I think 170 countries it could be more than that I could be incorrect about that but I mean it's a collaborative science endeavor it's the biggest human scientific project in the history of civilization okay so it's not just like a group over there talking to each other 
it's extraordinary and the science is impeccable but the problem with the science is it has emphasized the problem only and so that has been picked up so what we're full of in terms of the climate speak the climate movement and the activists is like we have problem 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 what we need to do is say got it wow honor the science believe and it's not i shouldn't say believe but i mean believe uh, that we have created something, you know, humanity, something that's extraordinary in terms of its scientific rigor, and then say, okay, what are the possibilities? Because every problem is an opportunity in disguise, without question, you know? And so that's what problems are for. Problems <laughs> are an opportunity. <laughs> They're not just like, a, you know, something, you know, a dead skunk, you know, on your front porch, you know, they are actually something that is a teaching that is an offering that is an opening. And that has what has that's what's been lacking. And so that's why uh, with a, a group of people I did, you know, Project Drawdown and the book Drawdown, you know, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. And it was 200 different people coming together as a collaborative as a small we uh, talking to the bigger we I didn't think this idea of a charismatic male vertebrate, you know, knowing something, you listen up, I know you don't, just doesn't work anymore. I'm sorry, with all due respect to, you know, those those charismatic male vertebrates that are out there, you know, that your day is over. And so it was very important that, that Drawdown came out of that, you know, sense of collaboration. We had uh, researchers from all six continents, you know, all major religions, you know, all genders and this. And same with Regeneration, which is the sequel to Drawdown. And, and, and Drawdown was very much about mapping, measuring, and modeling what we could do to reverse global warming. That's what Drawdown means. And it, I did it for two reasons. Linda. One is because we had never named the goal. We were still talking about mitigating. What does mitigating mean? It means reducing the pain of something, you know, or tackling or combating or net zero at some future date and so forth. But I'm going, well, what's the goal? The goal is to reverse it, to reverse, you know, the thing that are causing global warming, to bring it back to a state of climatic stability, which we had for so long. Um, but Drawdown was very much about what to do. And we did map, measure, and model it, you know, with, you know, exquisite, you know, analytics and, and so forth from, from people who really know what they're doing. And regeneration was always the sequel to Drawdown. And regeneration is like, yeah, okay, but let's, how can we get this done? How do you do these things? Not what to do, but how to do it. And so that's the difference between the two books. There's more to it than that. But, you know, that's sort of the way I look at, you know, the situation, which is we have to change the, the conversation. If we're not changing the conversation, we're going to get the same result. That is so true. And, and I think people are um, message weary when it comes to the problem, the problem, the problem. Um, I interviewed uh, Nate Robinson. He is the scientist. Remember in 2015 when this uh, marine biologist pulled a straw out of a sea turtle's nose? And that began the whole war on single use plastics. Um, you know, Nate and I spent two minutes talking about ocean plastics. Everybody knows that's a huge problem. What I wanted him to talk about was solutions. Like what is the everyday way of, of being that is compatible with the future we all want? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are so many for and nonprofit organizations right now addressing it, which we don't hear about. And a lot of them be the first to say, like, we're not sure we have the solution, but this is where we're going. Um, there are companies like Mori, MRI, you go to the website, look what they're doing. And uh, uh, they have a very, very safe coating for food that prevents oxidation and then disappears right away when you use it, uh, cook it, you know, whatever, so that you eliminate plastic in the packaging itself, you just use paper. Um, they are making sheet plastic. I mean, they're not selling it yet. There's still years of development to go, but I mean, Plastics made of fungi, you know, that are clear, just like saran wrap and all that sort of stuff, you know, that just absolutely dissolve and fade away in the environment. You know, there is the plastic drawdown group, you know, which is came out of drawdown. I mean, I, you know, which is really, uh, they signed an agreement with the Seychelles uh, just, I think, a month ago or this, this month, maybe in January. 
with the president of the Seychelles, you know, a program to completely reduce in plastic use and eliminate single use plastic in the Seychelles. And now that they have one country that are doing it, they're uh, saying, now we need 10, let's go to 10 countries. We did one country when successfully and in using the, I guess the, uh, what you call the prestige, you know, of the head of a country to contact other countries and just, you know, go throughout the world and ban, ban, ban single use and so forth and come up with substitutions and alternatives that really make sense. And so, again, this is really to what, you know, what, you, what you're doing, what you're dedicated to and so forth is really understanding this burgeoning movement in the world of people who really care and are in genius and who have great social intelligence and are active and uh, you know, from uh, 10 to 80, I mean, every age group and gender and ethnicity and around the world are waking up, you know, and they got the message uh, and they're applying, they're caring, that is, they care about their future, their family, their community, their place, their culture, uh, you know, all the things that live there besides them that are human beings and so forth, and they're acting on it. Uh, you know, what you're saying reminds me of um, uh, a really important concept that I think is is integral in helping us create a new narrative going forward for ourselves as individuals, like what's possible and just as a culture. I was in, uh, my husband and I were in Kenya in um, that huge, enormous slum um, back when, just a few months after, what's the slum called? Kibera. Kibera. Um, and um, we were, were we were doing an article about a group of artists there that make make the most unbelievable art out of found objects. Anyway, um, someone pointed out to us that we were there just two months after the government just suddenly out of the blue, boom, banned plastic bags in the whole country of Kenya, pretty much with no warning and no plan about what to do. No plan, yeah. Yeah, and guess what? <laughs> People found a way. <laughs> they worked around it. And and more than a few people made note to us that, you know how this place looks right here? It used to be just a sea of scattered plastic bags stuck on walls, in this mud, in the dirt. And I gotta tell you, it when you start looking around at what was missing, it was something else to be missing all those plastic bags. And and like I said, they had had come up with many, many countless solutions that we were like, oh, that's an ingenious way to do this thing without a plastic bag all through the whole, our whole stay there. Yeah. Tell, I, tell, I, tell I, me about I'm that. Do you have any stories about how necessity is the mother of invention? Well, you know, I mean, the, Bali too, you know, you walk in this, you know, this sort of paradisiacal rice fields of Bali, you know, and you look down, there's plastic everywhere in the rice fields, you know. And I was talking to a Balinese uh, person about that. I said, you know, older person, he said, you know, what happened is that for centuries and centuries and centuries, everything we used, everything we did was biodegradable, you know, and so we could toss it and it just disappeared, you know, sooner or later. And so the habit habituation of just it, tossing something away was there. And, you know, people just didn't realize that what they were tossing away was not biodegradable and would last and persist. And so I think it's an important way to, to look at, because we look at poor countries and we say, oh my God, you know, you know, they're, they're just casting stuff everywhere, it's a mess. But I think if we look deeper anthropologically, we're seeing people who have for a long, long time, you know, lived in such a way that was circular, if you will, that didn't uh, create, you know, a mass, didn't create garbage, didn't create waste, you know, that was toxic because they had nothing to create that waste with. <laughs> and we in the West were the ones who created, you know, basically those products and those technologies and so forth, and then sold them for pennies on the dollar, really, because they're made of fossil fuels. And um, uh, so I think always approach things with compassion, you know, and understanding as opposed to judgment and righteousness. You never do that. It just doesn't work anyway. But I mean, more or less uh, separates us from others and their plight. And that, that's true for everybody, whether it's, a, 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 frankly, a wealthy person or a poor person, whether it's, you know, a farmer, whether it's this or that. We, 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 we judging isn't going to get us there, put it that way, you know, and being right isn't going to get us there, you know, it's like being right in a car wreck, you're in a car wreck, that's the important point. And so, um, you know, the most important part of the climate conversation is actually our ears, 
which is to listen, 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 and then get the stories, get the understanding, create that sense of connection. Um, everything about regeneration is about making the connection, taking action. And you can't make a connection. Uh, you can scientifically, you can biologically, you can, you know, analyze and see with the plastic, but you have to make a deeper connection as well to be effective, you know, and that connection has to do, you know, we have two of these and one of these, and that gives you pretty much the right ratio uh, of what we should do in our lives, you know, which is listen twice as much as we speak. Uh, and that is what brings us together. And, and, uh, and that sounds so trite, you know, we got to come together. Um, and if anybody has a better idea, I'm all for it. Uh, but there is no better idea than us to coming together because we are already together. We are one uh, species, you know, I mean, I'm talking about human beings right now, uh, connected to every other species when there's about 10 million other species on the planet, you know, and our destiny and our plight in our future is inextricably linked, you know, inseparable. Uh, so that's why listening, watching, observing, you know, is so, so important in climate activism, not just righteousness. Okay, this is okay. So the righteousness comes to something I, um, I, I've really been paying attention to lately, I've really been trying to give my attention to the thoughtful, measured, helpful voices. Because zeal, that that zeal thing seems to be what triggers me to just turn off the news or the, turn off the this or tune out. And I know that that tuning out the news may be positive on one side, but not knowing about the world is not the answer long term wise. And so I really I want to hear your your thoughts about how we find or find the trustworthy measured voices on climate change. Well, I think it goes right back to understanding ourselves, you know, and all of us respond to something that comes from somebody's heart. Our heart responds. It, it can't not respond. It just does. It bypasses all the programming that we've had in our education, in our acculturation, in our advertisements, in the way we are just hounded uh, by uh, our society to be different, to buy more, to do this. And um, all those things are um, ignored by the heart. <laughs> the heart doesn't, uh, doesn't speak that language. And so I, I feel like the reason I use the word regeneration or use the title of the book and so forth um, is regeneration is the default mode of life. First of all, all 30 to 40 trillion cells in your body, Linda, right this second are regenerating. There's 400 million activities going on in every cell every second. All right, in every cell, you multiply that times 40 trillion, and you have more things going on in your body every nanosecond than there are stars in the universe. Okay. Darwin actually predicted that. And so that's us. We are a walking, talking, regenerative piece of protoplasm. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's why you can hear me as I where I can see you. That's why we can talk. All of us are the same that way. So we are innately regenerative. Okay, next, you know, every time we care for something, ourselves in the morning, take a shower, brush our teeth, whatever, you know, our children, our elders, our pets, you know, our community, our friends, our family, when we pray at church or synagogue or a temple, uh, what do we, all that caring that we evince and show and manifest on a daily basis is regeneration. That is regeneration. We're addressing ourselves to life itself and, and so forth. So in everything you see outside, everything that walks and talks and buzzes and grows and is green and this and that and swims, you know, is regenerating all right that's what it's doing this is the default mode of life so when we think of regeneration it's innate to us as opposed to 
you know, we have to tackle climate change. Give me a break. You know, what does that mean? You know, I mean, it's like, oh, what? Oh, and it just is confusing, you know? And of course, people know about solar and EVs and recycling, and they understand that most people do, but still, it's so abstract. And so when we take that language, you know, and we use war and sports metaphors to talk about something that is absolutely scientifically incorrect, which is that we're going to tackle climate change. First of all, you're othering it as if climate change is out there somewhere and you can find it and you could go tackle it, son of a bitch, you know, come on. Well, that language is just so bizarre. The second thing about that is that we can do anything about climate change, you know, by going at it. And the thing is the climate is supposed to change. If it's, if it didn't, we wouldn't have seasons and water and glaciers and rivers and fish and hummingbirds and honey and food. And, you know, I mean, the beauty of all the species in the living world is because there's a changing climate. All right. Uh, and so you can't fight tackle combat change. The climate is perfect every second. It's perfect. How could it be otherwise? Nature never makes a mistake. And it's, we are causing those changes. And so this is what we have to look at, you know, and it's not about combating and tackling and fighting each other, not at all. It's upside down and backwards. It's not about othering other people or cultures or races or genders or sexual preferences or religions. It's not about othering. That's the cause, othering the world, seeing oneself or one's culture, or one's tribe or one's class or whatever, as better and different than other is the cause of global warming. So we can't use that language to address it. And that's why regeneration is such an important word and concept uh, because it has such big arms, you know, it's like it holds everything. It is compassionate. It's kind. It happens anyway. <laughs> you might as well go with the flow because if not, you're dying. And, uh, but even life and death itself is part of regeneration, you know, and so forth. So um, when we talk about regeneration, it's to, it's, we're coming home to this heart. We're coming home, you know, instead of being sort of bedeviled or confused or stressed by a set of operating instructions, do this and do this and do this and do this and make, make sure you do that, don't do that and so forth. Not that those things are incorrect in their intent and purpose, but the fact is it, we need to come from source and sources right here, our heart, our caring for our, each other, the future, others, our pets, whatever it is, you know, all the things that it is and so forth. That is where the impetus to reverse global warming comes from and it can't come from any place else. That is so well said. I want people to know that that I've now taken already almost three pages of notes. So if you see me <laughs> writing away, um, that's I'm, I'm as fast as I can keeping track. And that reminds me that we are going to both my producer and I are keeping a track of wonderful things that Paul's reminding us of because I kind of feel like you're reminding me of things that I sh I should or or did once know, <laughs> just in my heart. And um, so we will have really good show notes of, of Paul's um, comments, know that, but that's what I'm working on when you see me looking down. Okay, so I want to run something by you that kind of connects with something that we, we've done a fabulous interview with of, of Dr. Um, David Cooperwriter, who is in charge of the other AI, a Appreciative Inquiry. Do you know Dr. Cooperwriter? Yes, I do. I, yeah. mean, I don't know him as a friend, but I know him as uh, a scholar. Oh, he is super. He's just a super guy. We've been kind of two ships passing for years, but we finally spent like quite a little time together. And then I did an interview. Um, uh, uh, I had we had a nice long conversation one day, and then I did a great interview with him that was just mind bogglingly um, open. Oh, it felt like an opening. And the reason why I bring him up is because um, he always talks. He talks about everything that we could or might say could be looked at from being generative like the way you pose a question to someone the way you interact with your nine, your 14 year old the way the way we talk to our mom who's beginning dementia whatever it is if we could just get ourselves in the mindset of being more generative about how we talk to others um organizational development wise everything 
could open the door on so much possibility because words matter. So tell me about, because I see what you're doing as the step past that. Okay, so once we get our mind in the right place about wanting to come together and generating a, a new world, um, then we start working on the regeneration part. Um, talk to me about this whole concept of generative, regenerative, because I think that's a word that doesn't come up in ordinary conversation around the water cooler. I don't make any distinction between generative and regenerative because okay. uh, generation is always re. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Gener yes. Generate. That's, it's just, um, I think regenerate, you know, came from the idea of, of something where there's been loss, you know, like, yeah. and it's used in, in, in a lot in the, in, in the Christian tradition, you know, in the United States, you know, uh, in fact, when we got our URL, regeneration.org, and it's this interesting story because so many people wanted that URL and, and nobody knew where it was. And uh, one of our directors, Julia Jackson, uh, said she has a family winery and said, oh, we have really good lawyers. They can find URLs. <laughs> They're really good at it. Or who owns them? You know, you can see it that it's owned, but you can't yeah. find out who owns it. And they found, we found out it was Michael Dell, a Dell computer. And uh, so we contacted him, or not him, but his lawyer, whoever, and they just, just blew us off. And I said, well, okay, that didn't work. And um, and then I happened to be in Bozeman, Montana, and uh, uh, with uh, uh, some friends up there who have a ranch and uh, and I mentioned it to them and they said, oh, well, our good friend out here in Bozeman, you know, actually was uh, Michael Dell's mentor. Really. And so you want to meet him? I said, yeah. And he's like 80 or something. And so we met him and uh, he listened and he said, write me a 200 word uh, letter to Michael Dell. Uh, not 201 words, because he won't read it, 200 words, and it said who you are, why you want it, what you can do with it. And so I wrote that on a Thursday in Montana, and on Monday we had the URL. And uh, they didn't even know why they had it. They had had it for 12, 13 years. <laughs> they just had it, you know, stashed away. But we got so many inquiries once we were up, you know, from Christian organizations who teach, use regeneration as a way of helping people who have lost their way, so to speak, you know, addicted or um, have engaged in behavior that's really inappropriate or, you know, basically have gone away from themselves, you know, it's not just away from Christianity, you know, it's away from, you know, and uh, doing such beautiful, wonderful work and, and I appreciate what they're doing as well. And so we're now in mutual appreciation, but we're not giving up the URL. <laughs> 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 uh, because regeneration if you know it applies to everything it's not just nature it's not just biology it's not just ecosystems it is all that for sure it's not just oceans and forests and grasslands and so forth uh it is society it's it's people it's culture it's our children it's like how we relate to each other you know it's about the inner city you know not just the you know uh outer lands and uh so it is like i say it applies to everything you know yeah. And so uh, Dr. Cooper Wright is uh, uh, thinking and about generative teaching us how to speak and inquire that way is so important because that draws out that entity, that draws out that energy and that understanding from the other person, from the person who's responding as to questions that are frankly confrontive, you know, or most questions are statements in disguise, you know, and people are not stupid and they can hear the statement underneath the question, which is you're making me wrong with your question. And uh, that's not generative, uh, that's degenerative. And I think on a larger level, uh, although it sounds like it may be a shift, but I want to go back to regeneration because we, ha if we step back and look at, well, who are we? What do we do? What do we buy? You know, what are we creating? What are we investing in? You know, when we look at the, uh, the whole economy, this incredible world economy that we've created, it is without exception extractive, you know, and this is not the first time that the observation has been made, but, but basically every supply chain, wherever you go, whether it's a service or a product, you know, you find us taking life. We are taking life to make something, to do something, to provide something.
and taking life is harming life. You're not just taking it and putting it from one jar into another. You are actually taking the life out of something. And so you're harming it or you're killing it. And, and so there's less and less life on the planet, less and less. So what we know, especially in the last year or so, uh, from the fires, from the droughts, you know, from just the, um, the, the extreme weather, from the weirdness that we're seeing, you know, in terms of our interaction <clears throat> with the weather and climate and so forth. I mean, migration and it's, it's just, it's the last year was very much a year when climate became something and global warming changed from being conceptual, like oh, I understand, yeah, uh -huh, to experiential or vicariously experiential, you know, and, and that, that shift, uh, is so important because I remember when I was at uh, Stanford Research Institute a long time ago, 45 years ago, everything I learned about climate at that time in climate science, I knew, we knew then and it's true now. I mean, we knew the basic mechanism of it and so forth, but all of us were sort of aware that, you know, people probably won't change until this is experiential. They're not going to change because they know it here. And, uh, and I think that's true. <clears throat> that's what's happened, but it is. And what we know is, and what we see is that uh, uh, extractive way of interrelating with each other and the world. I mean, Google is extractive, Facebook's extractive, Instagram's extractive. All the social media is extracting who we are and trying to market us, market to us and make us consume more. It's an extraction process. And what we know is that the road the extractive road ends, we can see the end of that road now, whether it's in our oceans or biodiversity or cities or social unrest or divisions uh, or uh, lo uh, loss of crops and droughts and famine and things are happening all over the world. And so we can see that road doesn't go much further. And so we generation is about saying, do you really want to keep going that way? I don't think so. Is there another way to go? And it's absolutely, we can do a 180. It's a 180 pivot, which is we can have an economy that produces better and more jobs. It has a GDP that is about commerce. Let's make a distinction between commerce and capitalism. That has commerce that's robust and innovative and imaginative. It creates more life instead of less. That's what we're talking about. Can we do things that create more life after all is said and done or less? So when you look at regenerative agriculture, it's about creating more life in the soil than when you started, you know, in the spring. By the time the next spring comes, there's more life in the soil. That is measured by carbon, but the importance is life itself because life creates life you know, in the conditions for life. And that creates healthier crops, you know, it creates more friable soil, it holds more water, it creates crops that, whether they're fed to animals or people, you know, are to create, you know, more healthy people and animals and so forth. You know, I mean, it just goes on and on. The cascading benefits of doing things in such a way that create more life are incredible. And so that's what we're talking about with regeneration. Okay, so this is um, is fundamentally the difference in um, this sort of this sort of way we go about looking at the future and what's possible is that in a regenerative or generative way of thinking, we're going to look for all the opportunities, and and that's instead of looking at it from the threat. Because I think one of the things that you said earlier that I just I wrote down was that so much of what's been said about climate change or the things we need to do come from a position of shame, fear, and guilt. Ugh. It, with all that opportunity that you just described pretty succinctly in commerce and and all the things that that can be done going in the right direction, we why we rest on this shaming each other. I I, I don't know because like you pointed out, it doesn't work neuroscience wise. But um, let's let's get to talking about a lot of this opportunity that you see and and your cascade um, of solutions and so forth. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, um, we're going to have Paul be very very additive to our lives and help us be a part of a future that we all want. We'll take a break. Dr. Linda here. 
If you are hoping the world is a lot better than what we see on the news and social media, and if you've been overwhelmed by the misery and negativity coming from the screens in your life, I've got a wonderful connection for you. What I've learned after almost a decade of curating the internet for insight and innovation is that there is an enormous wave of goodness and progress well underway in the world that almost no one knows about yet. And that's what led me to create this podcast. And then I co-founded the Goodness Exchange. The Goodness Exchange is an amazing place on the internet now where you can enjoy unlimited access to hundreds of articles that give you a more complete, positive perspective about the state of the world. You can listen to exclusive bonus content from this podcast with our guests who are knee deep in solving some of the world's most vexing problems, and yet they still think the future is bright. We need to know what they know. And at the Goodness Exchange, you can explore a feed of exclusively good news and recommended other kinds of content created by the Goodness Exchange community. No one with good ideas and good intentions need feel alone again. You are right to hold out hope for humanity. Millions of people are out there creating a better world, and we have created a gathering place for all that wonder. Who knows what's possible now that there's a place on the internet created to bring out our best impulses and our collective genius. To explore the home for goodness on the internet, visit goodness-exchange.com backslash membership. Thanks. Okay, we're back. So let's turn our focus on a couple uh, concepts that I have found personally so awe-inspiring. Any way I can connect to these these concepts, I try to. So, Paul, talk to us about this whole concept of rewilding. Well, <clears throat> there is an article, or not an article, but I mean a passage, or gosh, uh, not even a passage, but a piece by Isabella Tree. Uh, in regeneration, and she and her husband Charlie Burrell inherited on his side uh, a, fa a family estate that is back, I think, goes back to the 1100s. I mean, it's been in the family for that long, and it's an estate. It's a farm on what's called Sussex clay, which is just the worst soil possible you could farm in. It just turns to mud in the spring and cement in the winter. And um, so it's very difficult to farm and the farm is losing money. And they did everything they could, bought new equipment and more inputs and all these sort of things. And they lost even more money than they were before after they inherited it. And um, so they got in touch or they heard about this ecologist in the Netherlands called Franz Vira. And he was rewilding. He was taking a fairly large area in the Netherlands and turning it back to the, as much as possible, the species that were originally there in Europe um, in terms of horses and pigs, um, in terms of cattle, longhorn cattle, Tamworth pigs, etc. And then he just let it go. It was fenced, but he let it go and then watched the land regenerate, come back to uh, uh, a state that humans can never have created by themselves, put it that way. And that's exactly what they did um, uh, in, with their estate uh, in, in Sussex. And so they did that. They took down all the fences in between. They put a they ring fence it. They brought back uh, these uh, closest relatives to the oryx, you know, and the other, you know, ancient animals that you know, basically populated the UK and uh, and Europe, and uh, and then just watched to see what would happen. And it was so fascinating uh, for them. And everything started to change. And at first, everybody, their neighbors, were outraged. You know, because it looked like crap. You know, and they were used to farms and perfectly clean, you know, and you can see things in rows, you know, and everything was like impeccable and, uh, but not really, it was dead. That's death. <laughs> and, um, and today, after 20, I think it's 21 years now and so forth, um, 
it's just a wonderland. People pay to do safari tours uh, on the land, you know. Uh, people who are butterfly experts come because, you know, they have so many butterflies that you can't see in any one place in the UK. They have more red listed species on their 3,300 acres than all of the conservation areas in the UK put together. All right. The turtle dove came back. They have the first pair of nesting storks in 600 years in the UK. I mean, and the, this is the, so beautiful about it is this is what the earth will do. It's, it's how do you get turtle doves and nesting storks back to your land by not trying to, by, by creating the conditions, you know, for life. And, and really well, that's what they did. And, and I mean, the, the science and the, exploration and the the insights that are coming from this are just extraordinary and so forth and oddly enough um because they do have animals there the government would not let them have predators on the land they could kill animals because that's a normal you know you have deer you have wolf come on you know there is a symbiosis between prey and predator um, in natural systems and they couldn't have a predator so they have to uh, call the herds or the mm-hmm. herds will die then there's you know because they can't move beyond the fence line so they sell that it is the most eth- ethical meat in all of the uk and also the most natural <laughs> and they actually make a profit now on the farm as they never did before by not farming at all <laughs> so, <I know. laughs> so this is just one story and this has now become uh according to the poster child of wilding but it's happening all over the uk and all over the world now people are actually uh re it's called rewilding and uh, and it's really it's interesting it's like getting out of the way and in a sense you know as opposed to i'm going to rewild this you know actually it's the opposite you know which is i'm going to create the conditions um uh for life you know as opposed to you know, i know what to do we um on the goodness exchange we wrote wrote an article about a couple in Argentina that had a similar story where they inherited this massive amount of land and they're working on that. And I think the original my original exposure, if people want to look it up, and we'll put the links in the show notes. Um, there's an amazing TED talk um, uh, lab- called Rewilding: um, How Wolves Change Rivers. Mm. So I'd recommend that to people. Um, it's a, it's a story of what, when wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone. Then all the all the whole the whole of the ecosystem re- regenerated, and it was because of a level of fear. And that's a that's the uh, that that um, prey animals need to have, or they just eat everything clean down to the ground. And that brings me to another subject that I want to, you to comment on. Even last night, I probably watched it for the third or fourth time. I watched a wonderful um, PBS um, documentary. Um, a, I think you will look it up. We'll put it in the show notes. It's about keystone species and the advent of that whole realization of how think how seriously things are connected. Back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they took six scientists who actually um, produced our notion about how things are connected and how systems actually work. So talk to me about keystone species. You, you mentioned they had to cull um, in that particular example because predators turn out to be pretty integral to the way things keep going. Yeah, I mean, um, every system, forest, grasslands, you know, forest lands, oceans, uh, every ecosystem in the world um, has a very complex relationship between, uh, frankly, who's eating who. Um, even soil, if you look at soil, what makes soil dark and rich, you know, and it creates glomulin, you know, it's sticky stuff that then makes the soil friable and more um, able to basically uh, have a greater levels of water infiltration. It all goes down to all the virus and the protozoa and the bacteria uh, that are down there and they're actually all eating each other. <laughs> and so what happens is the carbon chains get longer and longer and longer. And so they're eating things that have more and more carbon and that carbon is dark, you know, and, and so that's what's happening in the soil. When you see soil, that's all rich and dark is because there's been a lot of 
uh, digestion. <laughs> There's a lot yeah. of eating going on down below, uh, and worms are involved, of course, as well. And um, so the key, the concept of keystone species is so interesting because basically a keystone species is a species that when it lives and acts and eats and you know and, and, and naturally, so to speak, um, that it creates more life for other species. So it's not intentional. It's not like a wolf saying, "I'm going to you know create a great park." Uh, it's just eating basically elk <laughs> and anything else they can capture, you know, that's on four legs. And, um, and so that concept of keystone species is uh, integral to understanding how ecosystems work. You know, that is that when you remove uh, a certain species, a keystone species, the whole thing can start to fall apart. And, uh, and we have to understand that they're not just apex predators that are keystone species like wolves, which they are, by the way, uh, grizzlies, etc. Also insects, you know. So it actually depends on the relationship. And um, but what's interesting is that there is on my board a woman named Lila June, and she's a Dene and a little bit of potato famine Irish, as she says. And um, but she's doing a PhD on food systems, um, pre-Columbian food, uh, food systems in the Americas at the University of Alaska. And she has a piece in there which is so instructive. And she talks about the what we see on the eastern seaboard, uh, eastern coast of the uh, United States. And, and basically 3,000 years ago, um, um, people, you know, uh, First Nations, I mean, uh, moved in, you know, to these forests, and uh, they made them into food forests. They, it, it, you, by doing core samples of pollen and what was going on, so forth, they can tell exactly, it completely changed the trees, the plants, the perennials, even annuals, and so forth. And they took what was wild, if you will, considered to be wild, and they made it a food farm for themselves. Now, when the colonists came, they thought these were virgin forests. <laughs> they, they were so beautiful and wow, look at it and so forth. We had 4 billion chestnut trees in the United States before the blight, you know. Um, if they were still alive today, they would produce two, 300 pounds per, for every person on the planet. <laughs> I mean, so, these were very rich and so forth. What she was saying is that the uh, Native Americans were keystone species. That's what they were doing. That we as people, indigenous people around the world, not we, I'm not indigenous, but I was once, of course, we all were genetically in some way or another form, but that's how they did. They created more life for those who followed. That's the seventh generation. There's a beautiful piece by uh, uh, Hindu Omaru Ibrahim, who is a, uh, a, a, a Rodian Chadian pastoralist woman, okay, and her mother sent her to school, which she was ridiculed for, because you don't do that when you're a pastoralist, you're going a thousand, you know, kilometers every year back and forth with your cattle, you know, you don't send your, girl, your daughter to school. And she became an expert in geospatial mapping and so forth to help uh, her people and the other pastoralists to know where to go when and so that the fodder was there, the water was there, etc. Anyway, she said something that was so important. She said, you know, yes, we think about when we make decisions seven generations ahead, okay, that is keystoning, right? Seven generations ahead, what impact will it have on the next and the next and the next and the next? And said, but the reason we can do that so well, I don't think she used the word well, but we, the reason we can do that is because we have a perfect memory of seven generations ago. We know what happened. And so they see themselves right there, you know, as, you know, between the past and the future. And what is your responsibility? Who are you within that culture, you know? To, is to carry on, you know, that tradition. And so it's so different, you know, we have seven generation as the name of a toilet paper, talk about cultural appropriation. I mean, God, it's just don't buy it. Uh, and tell them no, stop, change your name. That is so stupid. Uh, 
uh, and I know the intention was good, but it was, you know, this idea, you know, I mean, the song lines in Australia, we know about them, you know, and we know this 50, 60,000 year old culture, you know, of so-called Aboriginals, you know, but different tribes and cultures and so forth. Going along the song lines, you know, going from uh, uh, west to east, you know, and stopping and singing songs, songs that changed what were in the songs. What are they singing about? They're singing about that place. That song teaches you what that place is, what to eat there, what not to do, how to leave it better for the people who come in the song line after you and so forth. So we inherited a planet with 5,000 indigenous cultures who were practicing that and they were keystone species. And there's no reason why humanity can't become a keystone species again. And, and this is where we, we need to go in the next um, few minutes to, to round things out. And I can already see we need to spend more time maybe in a second interview on this. So let's turn towards solutions because you have this wonderful, the, the cascade of solutions. And I, I cannot move any further without recommending regeneration.org. It's one of the most beautiful websites I see. And that's what we do at the Goodness Exchange is point people to beautiful, honest, remarkable places on the internet. So that's saying something, visit regeneration.org. And there, Paul talks about, and all his team talk about the, the cascade of solutions. So tell us, tell us about this notion. Well, the, the, when you go to the website, the first thing it says is the world's largest listing and network of climate solutions and how to get them done. That last few words is really important, how to get them done. So um, the cascade de definitely shows, you know, from glaciers all the way to the oceans, you know, how everything is connected in that sense. But the, the most important part of the, of the book, Regeneration, is the website, not the book, um, because it all points to making connection and taking action. And the nexus portion is this listing and network of solutions, which is not complete yet in terms of the nexus portion. Uh, and what I mean by that is, Nexus is how to get them done, how to get these implemented, instituted uh, on all levels of agency. You know, I'm just a person, I'm just an individual. This is what I can do about degraded land restoration. You know, uh, we're a family, you know, we're farmers, we're a community, we're a church, we're a class, we're a city, we're a town, we're a company, we're a big company, we're a government, we're a county all levels these are all levels of agency and one of the things i think that's being lost in again the sort of you know climate conversation is that we go two ways this is what you can do like it's you know uncle sam you know in world war ii you know like pointing at you you know and you go oh okay and as you individual individuate the problem and then you know you know it just as an individual alone you know you can't make the difference that is required and then people then look to the conference of the parties in Glasgow and look to big institutions or look to the Biden administration or look to big government and so forth to solve it or set policy and really the solutions in between those two. And mm -hmm. everything in between is activated by an individual. So it's not in, there's no such thing as an individual. That's just a delusion we wake up with every morning and then we can eventually shake it off. We are all inextricably part of networks, you know, that we have created, that we're part of, that were created for us. And that is where we have the most influence, where the most effective, where we can join together, listen to each other and be very, very effective. And so nobody should see what they're doing on a local, regional level or whatever as being ineffective. It's the only place it's going to be effective climate is local in terms of reach, achieving uh, uh, reversal. It all starts here. What we do here is what matters. And governments will follow. They never lead, um, which they, is true. They, they're slow, they're ponderous, they're politicized, they're corrupt. And uh, sooner or later, sometimes they do the right thing. And that's a wonderful thing. And we pray for that but it's really on that level of agency and so nexus which is in the website talks to you about shares not what we know by the way it's what everybody's doing it goes right to your work linda and there's for degraded land restoration 
you know, link, 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 link. There's a 200 links in there about organizations and, and where all over the world and what they've done and what they've innovated, what they've imagined, what they've created with how they're doing it. And it just, it just, you get a sense of what's possible. Okay. So as we wrap up this conversation, it, it's, you know, our minds are expanded. <laughs> What do we do next, Paul? This is the thing about big, expensive conversations that I find a little bit um, hard in the world of making the world a better place is people will create all this stuff and, and make all these observations and then uh, we need to know what to do next. So we do. Share that. We do. Yeah, I agree. And that's really what Regeneration is about. The most important part of the book is the website, not the book. <laughs> I'm a writer saying, look at you can go right to the website, you know, if the book points to it and inspires you to get to it, you know, hallelujah, but you can go right to the regeneration.org. The most important about regeneration.org actually is Nexus. Nexus, and it says right at the outset of when you open up the URL, says, you know, regeneration is the world's largest listing and network of climate solutions and how to get them done. You know, that's what we all want to know. How do we get this done? And so when you look at Nexus, Nexus is a description of the solution from the point of view of agency. That is to say, okay, here's the, here's the problem, you know, one sentence, got it, you know, here's what it is, you know. Now, this is what you can do as an individual. And, and the thing is that we have to understand that an individual doesn't exist, and I say that in the sense that we're all part of networks, we're all part of community, we're part of family, we're part of companies, we're part of you know, neighborhoods, and so forth. We don't exist as an individual. It's just a delusion we wake up with every morning, you know, and, um, and we have to shake it off and then function as a part of humanity in whatever way we do. And so Nexus has what you can do as an individual for sure, in your home and so forth, but then what you can do as a family, as a neighborhood, as a community, as a city, as a town, as a college, as a church, as a synagogue, as a uh, classroom, uh, as a company, uh, as a county, as a province, uh, and it just goes on in all these levels who you can influence or, you know in terms of governance and these are things that you can do to influence or policy things that need to be adopted or not to be undone in some cases in some cases it's who are the bad actors who's screwing the who's screwing the boot here you know who's causing deforestation jbs the beef company and the amazon you know and so forth and it's probably being served at your college you know you might have a want to talk with jbs about what you feel about that and who this is for the boreal forest and for the amazon and so forth and so you have this amazing kind of splendid and broad and deep and diverse sense of what's happening in the world who's doing it the ngos who are the good actors here's the here's the great videos here's the great articles here's the great books on this you want to learn more and so forth so you find something like the great land restoration or insect you know extinction and you know it's like i'm really interested in that you know what to do you got the problem statement boom one sentence understand and the rest of it is all about what you can do and i would like to share something because i just wrote a piece about insects you know and i feel like the the i mean we are losing our insect population so fast it's just mind-bendingly frightening okay well what does that do to frighten the heck out of somebody? It's not that helpful. So what I've done is definitely talk about the importance of insects and also, uh, I'll send it to you, by the way, uh, you know, before it's published, you know, draft form of it, you know, so you can have it, Linda. But, but what I say is that that decline, the insect apocalypse, which, what it's called, being called, was discovered by a society of amateurs in Crefield in Westphalia, Rhineland in Germany, who have been since uh, 1905 been collecting insects and then you know putting formaldehyde putting a pin to them and identifying them <laughs> like you know nobody paid attention to that they just love doing it and they have this they had these 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 uh nets you know they put on the car and every month at the same time on the same road they drive for so many miles and then they 
collect what's in the net and they measure it in terms of biomass, how many ounces or pounds of insects are in those nets. Sounds a little bizarre, but that's what they did. And they were the ones who discovered that basically the flying uh, insect biomass was declining by 40 to 80 percent in just 30 years. And then scientists were shocked by their discovery and then verified it and groups all over the world basically said, yeah, us too, us too, us too. We're seeing the same thing. And that became the insect apocalypse. Okay, what Nexus shows is like, this is what you can do. But what's so interesting about this, and it's so beautiful what you can do about it. It's not like, you know, uh, go, you know, go to Syngenta and Dow Chemical and saying, stop using, you know, nicotinoids, I mean, and killing bees, that too. But it's really what you can do positively as well. And here's the beautiful thought part about it. These were amateurs who discovered it. Okay, what does amateur mean? It means the one who loves. That's amateur, that's French. I studied Latin for four torturous years, you know. <laughs> and amateur is the root of amateur. It means lover, okay? And so these are amateurs. And why did they discover this? Why? Because they loved what they were doing. And Linda, when it comes to planet saving and climate reversal, <laughs> global warming reversal, we are all amateurs, all of us. And the path forward is about falling in love. And this cascade of solutions that are in Nexus is where do you respond? Where does your heart, you know, light up? That's what you should do. And that's what you can do. And that is what's going to have the most profound effect and impact on reversing global warming. And so it's really, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of the conversation, it comes right from the heart you know, and we're all amateurs and we just want to acknowledge that and regale that ourselves in that, you know, no one knows exactly what to do, but we do know what to do when we come from our heart and we come from that space where we love, you know, and we do, we're all lovers in one way or another and so forth. And really regeneration and the climate crisis is asking us to fall in love with the world, which we may have fallen out of love with and so forth. And it is not a curse. It is a blessing. The changes we're seeing in weather is an offering. It's a hint. It's feedback. It's our mother asking us to respond to actually become who we truly are and come home. So this is a, a great spot to um, to wrap up our conversation and really pick it up from here, because I love this notion. It's all about falling in love again. You know, um, I see that when people feel hopeless, they they tend to um, to get into and this is all of us. Me, too. Some days yeah. you, you tend to get into a well, I'll get mine first. I once had a, um, a a really, really important thought leader in Haiti explain to me why corruption happens at the government level so so easily in places like Haiti. And he said, he said, Linda, they've given up hope on their community. They they what they what these government officials see is that they'll get theirs and then they'll do what they can yeah. for the community. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. they're not bad necessarily bad people for wanting to just get theirs in a place where desperation is looming right here at all times. And um I love this falling in love again thing. Does this mean like for instance, last summer I'm an am amateur naturalist. I am, am all EO Wilson is my hero, Paul. <laughs> I just love EO Wilson and his insects and all the things. So um, last summer, I noticed that we had kind of a silent spring. We had a giant pond in our front yard, and we we're all about the frogs. I even have a little recorder that I can call in certain frogs and so forth. And last last summer, uh, and we live in northern Vermont, that's pretty ecologically sound. Now, if, if I'm falling in love with my frogs it, and, and want to be a part of change and solutions, does this mean I find out who's doing frogs in Vermont and call them up and say, hey, what's going on with the frog population? Because I've been keeping track of it for 30 years, and something's changing. Is yeah. it at this level that you're talking about fa falling in love with things and taking action? Well, it is. I mean, it can be as as uh, uh, it can be reptiles, <laughs> you know. No, I just mean in general. It, it can if be people love, 
It, you know, like I had a thought leader the other day who is a part of the early um, locavore, eat local, farm farm to table movement back in the 70s. And she said, Linda, you know what the number one thing people need to recycle right now is? She's very direct <laughs> in her. Uh, and I said, no. And she goes, money. We need to recycle money in our communities because if you love where you live, you need to shop local so your money doesn't go out to Kansas or China or wherever, if we all support local, even the people in Kansas and the people in China, then we've got some shot at improving our communities and keeping the resources circulating. Yeah. And what you're doing is, is, is scanning the solutions that's called localization. Okay. Yeah. And that's, that's in regeneration and that's in nexus and so forth. But rather than just sort of say, you know, spend locally, uh, when in nexus, and I don't think the localization thing is done yet, but it's being worked on and so forth, you know, Michael Schumann's work and uh, others is all the different ways in which you can engender that so that it is the natural outcome of a community as opposed to, you know, um, uh, exporting your capital, which is what we do. You know, every community basically has its, you know, wrist slid in warm water. When it comes to capital, it ends up in London getting the Libor rate that night when you've gone to a big box retailer, you know, and you go, what happened? You know, and why are we getting poorer here instead of, you know, and that goes to localization. So I think the thing is that um, when I mean falling in love, I mean, be an amateur, you know, there's what do you care about? You know, that's all I'm saying. And what you care about is what you learn about, what you'll know about, what you can share about, what you can be most effective at. Um, and when I wrote Regeneration, I, I very easily could have said at the outset, you know, it's all connected, which is such a, it's a truism. It's true. I mean, but it's trite. I'm sorry. It's trite. It's a cliche. It's all connected, you know, like, thank you for sharing. And what I, <laughs> no question, it's true, but uh, it doesn't move the needle, you know, it doesn't move the ball down, nothing, you know, it's just like, you know, and what I did in the book is in, in, in piece after piece after piece as made connections that people might not have understood or known about and like, who knew and wow, that's connected to that. Uh-huh. And, uh, and so that what I try to do is create the spaciousness for people to change their mind. My job is not to change people's minds because I can't. It's hard enough to change my own mind for goodness sakes. And so you, what you do is create the conditions in which people can change their own mind. And that's true, whether it's in a, any, any venue, any situation, certainly in the book and so forth. So that at certain, a certain point, somebody reading the book and say, gosh, you know, it's, it, it looks like it's all connected. Like, uh-huh. <laughs> it's like <laughs> bingo, you know, and now they know it from a, the, cause they have come to it. They've emerged to that. And that's so important that we create those conditions. You know, the, the, the thing that, you know, how to change yourself, when you're worried and stressed and you're, you know, go, Oh my God. And, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I do have, you know, my elderly mother is going into dementia and I have this and I have a kid that's doing that and this and that, and you know, you go, I can't do anything else. Okay. I mean, I, it's not, I can't take on anything more. And the thing about, um, what we know about the human mind and how it works is that our beliefs do not change our actions. This is from Andrew Huberman at Stanford University, a neuroscientist, and that's the myth. And if we believe something, you know, that it'll change, you know, our actions, it's not true. Our actions change our beliefs. It's the opposite. So what you want to do is just do something. Just do it. Don't, th think it through don't outthink it don't outthink yourself don't just do small incidental whatever you think it is just do it and do it and do it and do it and you start to change and when we act we change the beliefs of people around us so action is where it's at it isn't in words it isn't in concepts it isn't in obviously we talked about earlier in, you know, hectoring people or browbeating them, you know, into action or doing something or caring. 
it's there. That caring is there in every person and so forth. It's creating those conditions. But as an individual, if you find yourself stuck, you know, and frozen or immobilized, you know, by the, 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 the enormity of this problem, um, forget all that. Just do something. And uh, don't think about scale. Don't think about whether it'll have an impact or be important enough. Start doing something. That's what you did, Linda. That's what you did. That's why you're doing what you're doing right now. Where did it start? Where was that moment? What was that, you know? I mean, everybody's the same that way, who's active in this movement and so forth. And one thing leads to another. And it's how we come alive, you know, in a situation where, you know, 70% of our children, that is youth, 16 to 24, are literally depressed. And they're depressed because they're coming into a world that has been created by their elders or by other generations that actually has no meaning and they don't have any purpose and they don't know what they can do and so forth. And, you know, that's going to be effective. And of course that's depressing. Of course they're right. They should be anxious. And what anxiousness and stress teaches us is act. Stress is there. It's a human emotion. It's there for a reason. It's not there by accident and is saying, do something, act. And that's what all of us have to do. If we, if, if we want to move away from that sense of paralysis, you know, that anxiety and depression give to us. And by creating a world where we are acting, we create a world where youth can find meaning and purpose and dignity in the life that they're going to lead for decades to come. That's just some beautiful stuff there. <laughs> Let's see. I started I somewhere back about 15 minutes ago. This is this is uh, you could pull mantras out of each of those for how to find um, what we're uniquely built to contribute, how to cultivate what we're each uniquely built to contribute, how we how we find um, by the end of the day a satisfaction, a a sense of um, joy about what what did go on even when it wasn't what we wanted. Um, you, you're really tapping into some very powerful, wonderful ways to reimagine our shared future, Paul. And I, I can't thank you enough. You're so for- welcome. I, I feel like my work isn't to know. Uh, that's my work, both Drawdown and Regeneration, is actually a, a hold up a mirror to the world and say, you know, we do know. And, and to reflect back to the world who we are and what it is that we can do and to come to understand that when you have unreasonable goals in your life, everything opens up your imagination, you know, creativity, innovation, your brain, your nervous system just explodes in possibilities. And when you have very reasonable goals, you know, basically they're reasonable because you already know how to do them and nothing really happens to your brain. And so the, the, the pathway in the future for each of us, you know, is to light up that imagination. It's about who we are. Yeah. You know, one of the people that um, I've spoken to, I, sh- I gotta look this up because I, I, I quote them all the time, um, says that, um, that most, the, the biggest problem with most problems <laughs> is that they just haven't received enough imagination. Right. Yeah. And that's right. Every problem is a solution in disguise. Yeah. 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 I mean, and like, let's look again, look again, look again. I could give you, we have another hour. I gave you a whole bunch of examples of this, you know, sometime, you know, where you have an intractable problem or this or that. And then the solution that's been discovered, whether it's technical or practical or, uh you know social or biological or whatever uh is like oh my god so ingenious you know so like wow and it's just about really looking at usually from just changing your perspective you know and part of the way you change your perspective is to look at a problem in a way as an opportunity as possibility as opposed to you know something that uh is inevitable and unchangeable immutable and uh, when you get out of that frame, your mind then looks at it from a completely different point of view. All right. So let's make that date. 
I, 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 I would love to talk to you again and, and have you tell us stories of examples of intractable problems that have been solved in the most ingenious ways. Yep. Okay, let's make that date. After we finish here today, I'll have my producer, um, Brittany, connect us because that is, you know, every time I, that's how, that's where I get my, my energy to keep going is that I can think of hundreds. We, I mean, at the Goodness Exchange, people are going to find a thousand articles about people who came up with the most ingenious ideas. And that is what makes me think I can find that same resource in myself. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. We're going to make that date. I can't thank you, Paul, enough for coming and starting this conversation with us. We're going to continue it. Um, folks, anything that you've heard us talk about is going to be in the show notes. There are links to the things we both mentioned. And, you know, remember to check out the Goodness Exchange and, and join us in a place where we are all trying to come together and elevate what's right with the world. To quote DeWitt Jones, do you know Nat, Nat Geo photographer DeWitt Jones, Paul? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, celebrate what's right with the world. Now there's a TED talk that'll change your, your day. So um, we will put, we will just have a pause here and we will chat again soon. People should look for that podcast interview and thank you so much for opening up a world of possibility that we all um, will share some brighter version of our future together. You're so welcome. And thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you so much for the goodness exchange. It's All right. Well, great. Okay. So I hope these connections to goodness and progress carry you through <laughs> your week and you'll start finding all the wonder that, uh, that Paul and I have been talking about for the last hour. Thank you, Paul. Have a great thank day. You. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you.